Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome hey, to everyone. our webinar. Coming in and teaching you about the squat today. I am Steve. I'm joined by the wonderful Carl from Rhode Island. How you doing, Carl? Great. Glad That's to be here. Great to hear. We're going to take you through everything that you need to know about the squat. We're going to start with some pre-test. We're going to do some anatomy. We're going to start with some techniques, some cueing, some advanced cueing, everything you need. And then we're going to finish with a Q&A. So thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you all. And let's get this started. So we all know what we're here for, and that is the squat. What you're going to learn in this course. So a lot of us know a little bit about the squat, but we want to share with you how we think about this. We're constantly going to courses. We're learning. We're kind of like cue junkies. We're always asking people like, what's your favorite cue? What's your favorite cue? What are your technique tips? We want to make things as easy as possible. And it's almost like having a toolkit that can be fit for multiple people. The more ways that you know how to cue, the more people you can help out because that cueing doesn't always work for everyone. So We'll hopefully learn a lot about the squat, a lot about cueing, our pre-tests, our proper techniques, and then some more advanced cueing. If people are putting up bigger weights, we might cue them a little bit differently. So we want you to be able to learn how to just sit down on the toilet all the way up to squatting your body weight and much more. So just a little bit about us. A lot of you already know us. My name is Steve Horney. I am a physical therapist. I started off in the manual physical therapy world very hard. I'm a certified manual physical therapist. And I was in the last five years, I've had a real shift in my practice, mostly due to this guy who was on my left. So it, it, it taught me pretty early when I got in a gym setting and got working with someone who really understood how movement could be a benefit, that manual therapy is helpful but it, it leaves you with a little bit to be desired when you're looking for long-term results. So that's kind of my story. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist. I'm certified in kettlebells, uh, HKC. I'm also a certified functional strength coach, according to uh, Mike Boyle. But really, I'm just a guy who likes to help people move a little bit better. And I'm a bit of a nerd who likes to take a lot of courses. Carl's going to introduce himself in a little bit. And I just want to tell you why we started teaching these. So to reiterate, we were doing a lot of, I was doing a ton of manual therapy and I would get good results, but I wouldn't get that carry over to the next session always. Um, I like being able to use my hands, but it does have certain limitations. You can make the brain feel better in the moment, but it tends not to carry over to the next session if you don't move the person and then load the person. That's the quickest and dirtiest way to get your brain to make a nice change is to actually put a little bit of load. So it's really paying attention and then you'll get to be able to build on top of that. So just doing manual therapy, the easiest way to think about it is like writing a whole term paper. And then just before you X out, you forget to click save. That movement therapy, that movement science knowledge, and that using what you just got as far as new range of motion is like clicking save before you hit close and it lets you build on it next time. So that's really how we look at the body. Manual therapy may make you feel better, but movement science is what actually is going to get you better long term. This is our structure of how we look at the body. So Everything's based on eight foundations. And at the bottom is your eight foundations of health. So for us, that's your sleep, stress, exercise, ergonomics, hydration, diet, breathing, and connection. We're not gonna talk about that today, but Sunday we're gonna be doing a deep dive into diet, one of those. And you can look on our website if you wanna learn any more about those. Today, we're gonna be talking in the movement and in the exercise world. So as far as movement, that is our assessment for everyone. So our eight foundations of movement are eight functional tests that we think you should at least know where you stand on. And not that everybody's gonna fly off the charts and be phenomenal on all of them, but you need to know about these range of motion deficits or strength deficits. And the most important part of the body that this, that this foundations of movement looks at or those eight tests look at is the pillar, which is from your shoulders to your hips 
and everything in between. So we make sure that we do a really good deep dive. Today, we extracted the three most important functional tests out of the eight foundations of movement for you, for your squad. Now, on top of that, we have our eight foundations of exercise. And that's what we're gonna dive into one of those today. Your eight foundations of exercise are pillar prep, which is preparing the area between your shoulders and your hips to have appropriate stability, strength, and range of motion. That's the first and most important foundation of exercise. The other ones are your squat, your hinge, or your deadlift, your lunge, your push, your pull, your locomotion, and rotation. So in general, most of the things that you'll see people doing in the gym will fall into those eight categories. And we want to teach you one good example of that, and then teach you another good example of that, and then start combining them together to make a really robust person who has what's good, called good general physical preparedness, which is preparing them for on the field, which is where our eight foundations of performance lie. So here's the list. Feel free to look. You have the whole PowerPoint you can click on. Go to our website and check these out. Specifically do a deep dive into eight foundations of health. That's a really robust portion of our website. If you don't have appropriate digestion, I don't know if we need to be talking about max one rep, one rep max deadlifts, to be honest with you. I think that it all has to play really well together. So start there and then work your way across. As we said, these are the foundations of exercise. Your pillar prep is always one. You do that every time. Then at least once a week, you wanna hit your squat, your hinge, your lunge, your push, your pull, your locomotion, your rotation. Those are really important. And just to give you a little bit of a sense on what each of those are, the pillar prep we already discussed, it's preparing the muscles from your shoulders to your hip. A squat, if you had to just break it down to its simplest form, is full knee flexion, full hip flexion. But a hinge is a little bit different. A hinge is full hip flexion, so bending the, that thigh towards the chest, if you didn't know what hip flexion meant. But just as much knee flexion or bending your heel towards your butt as is necessary. That's why a lot of times when you're doing your hinges, you'll feel it in the posterior chain or your hamstrings. Sometimes that'll limit the amount of knee flexion that can occur. And that's okay. That's what we want the hinge to be. The next is a lunge. Make it real simple. We'll just say that the legs are doing two different things. Some people would talk about how the lunge is a dynamic motion, meaning stepping back or stepping forward. That's cool. Some people put split squats and lunges as the same, meaning that your feet stay in the same place, but you lower yourself down where one foot is front of the other. But in general, let's just say that the two legs are in two different positions and they're doing two different things. The next is your push. That breaks down into horizontal, a la bench press, and vertical, a la a military press, and then your pull, vertical and horizontal. So a row would be a horizontal pull, and a lat pull down would be a vertical pull. The last two that we're going to round it off with is locomotion. In general, that's your carries, which are really important, but it really is just anything that moves from point A to point B. And then the last thing is rotation. Now we talked about anti-rotation up in the pillar prep, which means that you're getting those trunk rotators prepared to hold against a load that would pull them into rotation. This is talking about rotation as one of the eight foundations of exercise. We're talking about actually moving in the transverse plane, which has more power involved. And when I say transverse plane, that's this plane of motion. So that's where all of your rotations happen. Now Carl's gonna tell us a little bit about the age old question of what full squat. What's up guys, I'm Carl. Um, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I've uh, been in the business for about 20 years, uh, 2000 at the University of Rhode Island. I got my degree in exercise science. Uh, went on to get my doctorate in physical therapy. Uh, I worked as a personal trainer in some gyms, worked as a trainer and strength coach in Manhattan. It, that's where I met Steve about 14 or 15 years ago. Um, that was his first job as a physical therapist. I was working as a trainer. 
And yeah. <laughs> and then I, when I decided to go back to PT school, um, I had to do a clinical affiliation. I really wanted to do one with Steve and he let me, I don't know why, but he did. And big mistake ever made. We've been, <laughs> we've been a, a team ever since and we're learning a lot and, and having a lot of fun. Uh, we take tons and tons of courses. We read a lot. Um, and we just try to take, you know, the best stuff that we learn and, and simplify it and bring it to you guys. Cool. So squat, what's a squat? Why are we here? We're here to talk about the squat. So I'm sure we all know what a squat is. We probably all squatted. Um, you guys want to just learn a little bit more about it. Um, the way we look at it is, it, you know, it's a fundamental movement pattern. Um, you know, we start squatting when we're babies. Uh, we have to get up, get down. We sit down. Uh, we stand back up. You know, that that's a squat. Um, you got to get down off the floor, down and up off the floor. That's a squat, too. Um, so what does it mean when I say it's a hip dominant movement pattern? Um, you know, you have a bunch of joints, ankle, knee, hip, uh, spine, shoulders, basically athletes need to move about the hips. And if you're not really moving about the hips, you're not an athlete. It can really cause, cause injuries to, uh, knees and, and ankles and other joints. Um, it's the basis for all other athletic positions. It's the basis for other athletic positions. I'm sure Carl's going to be back in a second. Um, that's that ready position that you kind of want to be thinking about. Carl, I told them how it is the ready position, um, how your butt's a little bit back. Take us through how it's the basis for other athletic positions. No, I, it, exactly. That's it. So, right, right. so yeah, it is in athletics. Yeah, that that's pretty much the the basis for that. So like your ready stance, but it's also it's also uh, jumping, landing, um, accelerating, decelerating. Um, so you know you're gonna get a lot of your power and speed off, off of these movements and developing speed and power uh, through the squat. It's it's pretty much the the cornerstone for for uh, all your athletes is get, getting strength and power in the squat. Um, and th there's just a lot of variations off of it, but they're, they're all pretty much the same fundamental pattern. You got your back squats, your front squats, goblet squats, zercher squats, split squats, single leg squats. Um, list goes on and on, but basically it's, it's pretty much all, all the same. There's, there's only one true squat. So I'm gonna take us to the next slide through here. Carl, I just told him I'm gonna take us to the next slide. Sure. And then it's all you for, for that. Cool, I'm just gonna keep on rolling with this. This is very exciting. Um, yay, Corona. So what we're going to be looking at here, I'm just going to take this through, Carl, give me a second. So what we're going to be looking at here, as far as the range of motion and the strength, as far as what's necessary for that squat is you have to have appropriate ankle dorsiflexion. So that means that your knees need to be able to travel over your toes. That's really important where a lot of people get hung up because as we get a little bit older, as we sit at desks a little bit longer, as our feet hang just a little bit longer, we end up getting a little bit stiff through that joint. We also put ourselves in shitty shoes that end up putting us in a little bit of a pitch, which means that our brain never really gets the messages that you're in full dorsiflexion. If that doesn't happen, your glutes can't work. If your glutes don't work, you're in a big heap of trouble. We're also gonna look at the knee flexion abilities, hip flexion and extension. T-spine extension with the wall angel and shoulder external rotations really were really important, especially for a back squat. Carl, talk to us a little bit about the strength. Okay, so strength for the squat. Uh, a lot of, you know, 
knee extensors, hip extensors are, are, are the big ones. Obviously, you have your glutes and hamstrings, the hip extensors that are going to raise you up. Knee extensors, the, the quads that, that are going to extend your knee as you come up and, and control you as you come down at the knee. And then one thing that people don't really think about that often are the, the ankle plantar flexors or your calf muscles, uh, the, especially the soleus. Um, if you think about it, the soleus is really almost like a, a knee extensor when, when you're doing the squat. And of course, the trunk stabilizers, if, if you don't have a solid, solid base to work off of, you, you really have nothing. So now we're going to take you through the cowboy sit. So this is the first actual, literally the first assessment that we do in the gym when someone comes to see us is we look at their toes, we look at their arch flexibility, we look at their ankles, and then we make sure that they can do that, bend fully at their knee, and then put a little bit of load on that foot. So I'm going to show you a video through here that is what's called the cowboy sit. And then we're gonna talk about it just a little bit. Over the next eight weeks, we're gonna be taking you through our eight foundations of movement. Our eight foundations of movement are eight different functional tests that help you identify what you need to work on the most in your body. In that, we catch the things that we see the most in people. Some people have stiff toes, some people have stiff middle backs. A lot of people have very similar physical impairments and we wanna help you identify them along with doing a really good look at your pillar or the muscles from your shoulders to your hips and everything in between. So the first one is called the Cowboy Sit Plus and Mark's gonna help us show that position right now. For the first part of the Cowboy Sit Plus, we're gonna look at how we can load the great toe, arch, a little bit of the ankle, definitely the knee, and then see how all that responds to a bit of pressure on it. So a good cowboy sit is gonna look like this. Your toes are tucked under, your heels touching your butt, and you're totally vertical. And I can hang out in this position for a decent amount of time. Now let's see what it's probably gonna look a little bit more like in the clinic. Come on down, Mark. So same cues, toes are tucked under. I'm gonna say, Mark, I want you to put this butt on that heel. He's gonna go back and do the best he can. Then once he gets that as close as he can, he's gonna sit upright as vertical as he can. Take a picture of that so you see what it looks like. Because after we prep your pillar, I promise it's gonna be better. But then the plus part is we're gonna check dorsiflexion. For that, Mark's gonna put his hand right here put this to give us a marker, and he's gonna drive his knee in front of his second and third toe while watching his heel so that it doesn't come up and see if he can touch it. And that's pretty good. So that's the plus portion of the cowboy sit, which is our first foundation of movement. Post below, tell us how to go. So just to kind of reiterate what we said in that video, which I hope, again, when we put up these videos, that's not just like watch time. They do kind of give you enough time to get on the ground. So if, right now, if you still have your sneakers on, like take your sneakers off, be ready to go, but really check out yourself in that position. So tuck your toes under, really feel if you can get that butt as close to your heel as possible, and then try and get as vertical as possible. If you're watching this with someone else, have them take a picture of you on the side so you can compare your right side and your left side. That's the first part of the cowboy sit. But an equally important part is the second part. That's just that dorsiflexion. Again, I'm saying words that I think most of you know, but, but maybe you don't. So dorsiflexion is your toes coming up towards your nose or looking like this with your ankle. That's really important because it allows, the and pretend that this is my foot, 
and then this is my shin, it allows the shin to advance over the toes. That's really important because if you run out of room with that, you'll start to pitch forward. You'll round through your body to get lower. That angle decreasing is an important part of the lowering that happens in your body when you're doing a squat. And if you run out of that and get stuck, that's when you see people pitch forward a lot. So it's just something to really look out for. While I'm talking here, if you if you haven't, just do that cowboy sit and then check the both sides of it. So get both sides, do part one and part two. The next one that Carl's going to talk about is a wall angel. So again, I'm going to give you two seconds right now. Like go find a wall, bring me over with the phone, and I want you to do this wall angel on your own. I want you to walk out knowing how prepared you think your body actually is for squatting. Here we go. For our sixth test, we're gonna do what's called a wall angel, but we like to do it with a little bit of a lumbar lock, meaning that you can't cheat through your lower back as well. So we put you in this position, your hips, then your knees in front of your hips, and your feet are in front of your knees, and you're sitting up against the wall. Get all the way back to the wall as close as you can, and then give it one more good little scoot to get in there. Then, good contact, gently tuck your chin, and he's gonna rotate his arms at about 90 degrees all the way back till they touch the wall behind him. Perfect. Once he gets there, he's going to bury them into the wall and then drive his hands up as he exhales and see how close his hands get to over his shoulders. A really good test retest. Where did you feel it? What did you feel? Did it feel symmetrical? Again, against a wall, you're going to get some really good information. Take a picture before and after. Great. So like, like Steve said, thoracic extension is the most important for all types of squat that you do. So if I try to squat and your thoracic spine is your middle back, if I try to squat and I don't have good extension in my thoracic spine, which is my middle back, I'm probably going to end up rounding out my spine and that's going to put a lot of pressure on my back or I'm going to bend forward a lot more kind of like you see with, with the, with the ankle stiffness. Okay. So with that wall angel, okay. Can we go back to the wall angel, Steve? So with the wall angel, when you're sitting up against the wall like that, you're, you're locking down the low back. So there's no motion in your low back. And you're really getting the true test for the extension of the, the upper back, which is what's so important here. You're also checking external rotation of the shoulder, which is only really important with the back squat. So why it's so important with the back squat is if I don't have good shoulder external rotation, I'm going to end up pitching forward again or I'm gonna have pain in my shoulders. I'm also not gonna be able to use my lats the way that I need to lock them down and use my lats as, as a trunk stabilizer, which they are in the squat. So most people aren't gonna be able to tolerate, or a lot of people aren't gonna be able to tolerate that test sitting down up against the wall. So you do, do you always have to do it like that? No. You can stand up against the wall. That takes a little bit of pressure off of it. So if you really need to, you don't need to sit down. You can stand up against the wall. If that's too hard for somebody to, feel free to get on the floor and have gravity help you a little bit with that external rotation. So we have a few options for that. All right, now I'm gonna take you through the bridge squeeze. Um, this is in here 
because it was probably one of the most aha moments for me when I realized how asymmetrical my glute firing was between my right glute and my left glute. We, we were down at a course when we were getting our uh, hard kettlebell cert and they put us in this position. It was nothing particularly crazy, but it, it they coached it better than it, I had heard it coached before. And for me, it really drew out that I had no ability to contract my left glute voluntarily. Now you can kind of make two cases like one, that's a little bit different from doing it in athletics. Um, maybe it does come on involuntarily when you're just doing motion. But I, I almost take the other side is like, if I can't think with all my might to try and get that glute to fire and I give it everything that I have and I just can't literally get it to contract, there's probably no chance that it's actually helping me out in sport. And that's why my lower back and that's why my groin and that's why my hip flexors are working so much harder. You're always going to figure out what you need to do. You, It's just whether your body's doing it where it's sharing the load or whether it's having one thing get overheated and that's where we get our overuse injuries. So I'm gonna show you the test again. Get down on the ground, do this test. If you don't have a yoga block, use your sneakers, but come out of this next minute with understanding whether you access your right glute a little better, your left glute, or maybe you feel it in your back or maybe you feel it in your hamstrings. It's the same three questions for every single one of our foundations of movement. It is where do you feel it? What do you feel? And did it feel symmetrical? The third test in our foundations of movement is a bridge squeeze. So we're gonna be checking the glute func function primarily. And again, with all of these, it's where do you feel? What do you feel? Does it feel the same on both sides? This is the one where feeling the same on both sides is really, really obvious. So lay down on your back. You're gonna be in this bridge squeeze position, bend your knees, squeeze your shoes. I'm gonna coach you through it real quick. Palms up, bury the backs of your hands down into the ground. Don't forget about your thumbs. Inhale, exhale your ribs down. At the bottom, refill a little bit, tuck your belt up towards your chin, pressing your bat gently into the mat, heels into the ground, toes fold up, drive up, mark your hips into the bridge, squeeze your right glute as hard as you can for two count, squeeze your left glute as hard as you can for a two count, squeeze your right glute as hard as you can for two count, squeeze your left glute as hard as you can, two count. Ten on each side, where, what, sides. Steve, can you can you hear me? Oh, did I just do a whole rant without? Oh you god! Did. Could you see the enthusiasm? <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. oh my I god! I got so it. excited. <laughs> All right, let's do a rant with the mic on. Sorry, we have to turn the mics off when the videos are up, or else it gets feedback. That was awesome. So, with just as much passion as I just had, let's talk about why I think that that block in between the knees is such a good idea. So. 
the glute max does three different things. Your glute max extends the hip, which means it brings your thigh bone back behind you. It also brings your hips into abduction, which means that you bring your thigh bones away from each other or away from midline. You can remember that by thinking if a child gets abducted, they're taken away from their parents. So when that thigh bone gets taken away from midline, that's hip abduction. The other thing that it does is hip external rotation, which is like spinning your thigh bones away from each other, spinning your knees away from each other. So the question that gets asked a lot is, wouldn't I be better served to put a band around your knees, have the person drive up into hip extension, and then have them drive their knees away from each other, which is hip external rotation, and drive their legs away from each other, which is hip abduction. But I think that it's actually a better way that we teach it because you actually end up canceling out two of the motions that the glute does and just really assessing that third hip extension moment. So you put that block in there, you have them gently squeeze it. That's hip internal rotation at a deduction adding towards the body, which cancels out hip abduction and hip external rotation fibers. All we're left then is looking at what that glute can do in pure hip extension. Woo, even better the second time. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, well, and I, I prefer abducted by aliens. I don't know about <laughs> You're right. I'll say that next time for sure. All right. Carl, I'm going to get you going. You can take over the PowerPoint with the um, arrows on the bottom. Cool. Just kidding. We're going to show you the squat. This Carl's amazing video that he made for the squat, which I'm sure you've all watched on our Instagram 700 times. Hey guys, I'm Carl from Integrated Health Sciences. We've already covered the eight foundations of movement. Today we're covering the eight foundations of exercise. Okay, We've already covered the first foundation of exercise, which is the pillar prep, and you can see it on our Instagram every week. Now we're gonna cover the squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, locomotion, and rotation, okay? First one, the squat, we're gonna use the kettlebell squat. So you have your feet about shoulder width apart. You can turn your feet out a little bit. Make sure your knees are spread. Grab the kettlebell by the horns. Lift it up to your chest level. Good. Elbows in, pull it apart. Pull yourself down until your hips are about level with your knees and push the ground away. Good, and repeat. Awesome. All right, and that's it. That's all you need to know. All right, see you Boom. later, guys. Like that. <laughs> Great. Okay, so you know that, that's a really you know we had to get that in in what like like a minute or so. Um, so those are some really quick cues. Um, when Steve and I did the Mike Boyle certified uh, functional strength and conditioning uh, coach cert certification, uh, I think we had to demonstrate or cue some exercise in what was it was it thirty seconds. Yeah, it was actually 20 seconds, I think, because I took like a minute and a half, and he was like, we'll be here all day. I was like, I wanted yeah. to explain the rationale. 20 yeah. seconds. So, yeah, you, you do want to keep it as simple as possible. If you're a coach, you know, if, if there are any coaches out there listening, um, you definitely want to keep it as simple as possible and try not to overcoach some things. Um, but if you really want to do a deep dive, there, there's so many different ways to cue uh, the squat, and, and I, I find it's really helpful, like, the more ways you learn how to cue it, um, the more you'll get out of it for yourself and, and the easier you'll be able to explain it and, and show it to somebody else who's having a, a tough time uh, getting it. Um, so let me show you the goblet squat, which is one of my favorites. Got one of my kettlebells over here. Mike. Because of, of the coronavirus, my cameraman's out. So. <laughs> and my beard is strong. You know, I actually stopped. Like, I grew all of this since we've been in quarantine. Is that weird? I grew all this yesterday. So. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Yeah, yeah. All right. So 
the goblet squat. I love the goblet squat for a few reasons. Um, it's front loaded, which kind of makes your, your core, I think, work a little bit harder and, and makes you really have to kind of stay a little more upright and, and get that extension in the thoracic spine. Um, so go ahead and get your feet about probably shoulder width apart. It really depends on the person's anatomy of the hip. So you kind of find what, what's comfortable for you. Everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. So their hip so sockets are going to be shaped differently. Um, I find it a little comfortable from more comfortable if I turn my toes slightly out and I'll probably go around shoulder width apart. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the handle and I'm going to grab it by the horns. Elbows are in and I'm actively pulling this apart. That's going to get my lats turned on. We talked about the lats before as a trunk stabilizer. They go all the way from the pelvis, let's say, all the way up to your arm. So they're big muscles that become trunk stabilizers in this exercise, the squat. So first thing we do is we spread the floor, we grip the floor with our toes. And then if you can see the rug here, I'm kind of spreading the rug apart in between my toes, not letting the insides of my feet come up. And that brings my knees out. That's turning my glutes on really hard there. Okay, so I'm creating some tension there. I'm creating tension by pulling this apart. And I'm exhaling my ribs down. Now I'm going to pull myself down, keeping that tension, spreading the floor. And range of motion is going to differ for everybody. Um, but I like to get the crease of my hips about level or a little bit below my knees. And then I'm going to push the ground away. And I'm going to keep that tension. I'm going to keep pushing into the ground and the, until I'm ready to pull myself down. Pulling myself down with my hip flexors. Knees cracking. And back up. And that's how you do the, the goblet squat with the, the kettlebell. We can talk a little bit about breathing uh, a little bit later on. All right, I'm going to take us through the anatomy. I'm not going to waste too much time because I actually almost rather answer some of your questions. But as we talked about, well, I talked about it twice. You guys only heard it once. This is the glute max. And what it does, again, is goes from the pelvis to the thigh bone, and it brings that thigh bone back. It spins that thigh bone out and it brings that thigh bone away from the midline the way aliens would bring a thigh bone away from a midline. The other muscle that's really important to know is what's called the gluteus medius. So similar function depending on the fibers because you can see they're not too far from each other. But when you think about the gluteus medius, you really want to think about three things. One is it's really good at bringing the leg out. It's the posterior fibers or the back fibers are really good at spinning the legs away from each other. But the fibers that are on the front, and you can see this, I can't really zoom in, but like, see how if you were to draw a line, like pretend like this guy uh, is wearing a, D, a girl actually is wearing Adidas pants, you know, those lines that run straight through those lines are kind of where the hip joint is. So you can tell that if this person was wearing some Adidas pants, some of the muscle is going to be on the front of it and some of the muscle is going to be on the back of it. The muscles that are on the back of that Adidas stripe are going to be external rotators, are going to spin the knee, nose or spin the knees away from each other. And the muscle fibers that are on front of those Adidas stripes are gonna spin the knees towards each other. So it's a little bit of a jack of all trades because it's a bit of a wide spanning muscle. Depending on which muscle fiber it is, it can have a very different function. But all of the fibers stabilize the pelvis so that it stays nice and even. A really good test for that is stand on one leg, do our single leg stance test. Have someone look behind you and see if that pelvis drops. If when they stand on their left leg, their pelvis drops, their left gluteus medius isn't as strong as it should be. And same thing for the other side. So that's a really important muscle to know. 
Your hamstrings have a lot of different things that they do. So your hamstrings go from the pelvis and they insert into the thigh bone and also into the shin bones, which is really nice. So your hamstring is three different muscles. You don't need to know any of the names, but just know that they have two really big important functions. They bring the thigh bone back or do hip extension, and they also bend the knee, meaning they bring that heel towards the butt. The reason why it's so important to know that it has two functions is because you can slack the hamstring on one side, i.e. bending the knee, and then you'll get more hip range of motion, or you can tighten it at the knee, meaning having a really straight leg, and then you'll get less hip range of motion. So a lot of times when people get into specifically a deadlift, they'll feel that hamstring, and that can be augmented in a couple of ways, but understanding that the hamstring goes into the pelvis means that it's really, really important for you to have your pelvis in a position where the ribs are stacked right on top of it, which isn't in what's called an anterior pel pelvic tilt or what you might call a duck butt. Think about that duck butt as bringing the start of this muscle, which you can see right there in the green, away from the end of the muscle, which is in blue. If you start off in that position, you're already limiting your length. And a lot of people have hamstring range of motion deficits or hamstring flexibility deficits. So it's really important for you to understand that relationship between the knee, the hip, and the pelvis that the hamstring can be involved with. Next is your quadriceps. If you look up here, it's kind of cool that most people don't think of the quadriceps as a pelvic muscle as well. But just like the hamstrings, they come off of the pelvis and the thigh bone. Think of this as your front hamstrings. So the same story applies, the same narrative of if that pelvis is in a different position, meaning it's cocked forward or it's tucked too far under, it can put stress or strain into that quadricep muscle that can end up affecting the way that the knee moves. So it's just important to understand how all of these muscles work together in order to give you the appropriate form and how sometimes they can work against you in ways that you wouldn't even think that they could. Now, in our cueing, we talk about pulling yourself down in. So there's two reasons why we put this slide here, which is your hip flexor, beautiful, beautiful drawing of it. So one is your hip flexor is a main trunk stabilizer. A lot of people don't think that it comes off the spine, but it does. It comes off really, really close to the spine, actually. So it attaches right into those lower back vertebrae, but on the front. Then it also comes off of the pelvis, which is really important. And then those fibers come together, go, go into the thigh. The two reasons that it's really important is one, it's a trunk stabilizer, meaning that it just needs to fire to keep everything nice and uh, pressurized, if you will, nice and stabilized. But the other thing that's really important is if you're doing this right and you're keeping good tension in your body, you're gonna pull yourself down into the squat. You don't just wanna lazily let gravity take you down to the ground. You wanna be an active participant in that lowering or eccentric phase. So that's why these hip flexors are so important. Now, the adductors, which is what we talked about, they have multiple functions. So they can extend the hip when the hip is flexed, and they can also flex the hip when the hip is extended. That's a really fancy way of saying that no matter what position your thigh bone is, your groin is going to help you bring it back to neutral. So it's a really important stabilizer of the hip and also will be something that if your glute isn't working all that well, your groin or your adductors are gonna kick in. If your hip flexor isn't working all that well, your groin or your adductors are gonna kick in. Always be thinking about the shared responsibilities that these muscles have. And when there's overlap, if one's not doing its job, the other one's gonna get burnt out. A quick and easy analogy is just think about new parents. If you look at new parents and one of them's totally disheveled and looks like they can't even get out of bed and the other one is pristine and looking fantastic, 
The one that's the problem is probably the one that looks pristine and fantastic because they're not carrying their weight. They're not sharing the load. The person who's been overbearing by all of this weight that's been put upon them, which sometimes is the adductors or the groin, is the one that's going to get those tendonitis and those strains. I can speak from personal experience, not having a glute that worked all that well. I had chronic adductor or groin problems, and it wasn't until I sorted out that glute that the groin started to give me the range of motion that I needed and the strength and the power that I needed and started to be an active participant without being totally overbared. The next is the abdominals, just a really pretty way to describe it. So you have your transverse abdominus, which is the corset. That's the deepest one in there. Then you have two obliques. You have your internal and your external obliques. They rotate you and they also side bend you. But when they all four of them fire together, they trunk flex. The other thing they do is help you with forced expiration. And then they also help you build that intra-abdominal pressure. On the outside of all those, you have your rectus abdominis. Um, that's like your six-pack muscles, mostly for show, not as much for go. The lat is something that we talked about, which is really important. It's a huge muscle. So it goes from your pelvis and your lumbar spine, including your lower ribs, touches in, in a lot of people, there's some different studies say different things, the shoulder blade, and then goes into the arm. We don't even need to know where it goes from and where it goes to, to realize by looking at this huge muscle that it can do a lot of different things. So in the right position, the, the lat can be a trunk side bender. In the right position, the trunk, the lat can be a trunk rotator, especially if your arms are up and it's already pretension. So don't just think about the lat as its typical anatomical, like it's a shoulder extensor, it's an internal rotator, and it's an adductor. Think of it just as you think about any of the other trunk stabilizers, just like the obliques, that it has to be working well in order for you to build good intra-abdominal pressure and have good trunk stability. The last two are the muscles that are what are called plantar flexors. So plantar flexors is like if you're pushing a gas pedal, those are really important because when you're in the bottom of that squat, they're what help to pull your shin bone back up to vertical. Now that's important in a squat and they can work with more of their slow twitch or type one fibers, but these muscles are really important in order for you to have good power. When you are sprinting, you are really working your gastroc and to a certain extent your soleus to their maximum capabilities. The last one is the diaphragm. Really important stabilizer. We just threw this up so you could see how, how big the diaphragm is and how many attachments it has. So it goes all the way around on the bottom of that rib cage, attaching to the lower ribs and to the sternum. It's really important in a way that it interacts with those bones, but also think about it as building intra-abdominal pressure. From that, you can see the diaphragm right now is a little bit up, but if you were to contract the diaphragm, which means that it would be pulling down towards your groin, that's gonna fill up the lungs, but what it's also gonna do is push your organs down towards your pelvic floor. It's pushing your organs down towards the pelvic floor. Your pelvic floor is receiving those organs. And then that helps as an important part of building intra-abdominal pressure, which is the pressure that your body has 360 degrees around. Think of it as a filled Coke can is way more strong than an empty Coke can. If you have your diaphragm in the right position, a la your ribs are stacked on top of your pelvis, and you breathe appropriately nasally down, or even just breathe down into your groin, you're gonna have a nice filling of that Coke can. And again, a full Coke can is a lot more stable than an empty crushable Coke can. Last one, just we talked about is the pelvic floor. Same thing, these are really important muscles that have to be working appropriately. And the best way to make sure that your diaphragm and your pelvic floor are working together is to get that rib stacked on top of the pelvis, which I'm gonna show you a video in a couple of minutes, which is breathing behind the shield.
Carl's now going to take us through the remedial cues. We're running a little bit short on time because we definitely want to answer your questions. We may just come back to you guys next week. My hunch is that it would end up being on Tuesday next week, but be on the lookout in our newsletters because we're already at 50 minutes. Um, Carl, do you just want to quickly take us through some of the remedial cues and then we can do our Q&A and we'll actually ma just make yeah. this, this was part one of our uh, of our webinar. It's This is a good problem to have, but we're going to run out of room in about 10 minutes. So take us through the cues, Carl, and then we'll just answer the Q&A and then that'll be it for tonight. Yeah, we haven't even really gotten to the juicy part. So I think yeah, we'll definitely we'll come back to let, let's kind of assume that we're going to do 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, and we hope to really see you all there. So, Carl, take it home. Cool. All right. So if, if you're having trouble with the squat, and what we usually kind of see is this, one thing you can do is take a dowel here. So you're on three points, one behind your head, mid-back, and around your sacrum, like right below your low back, okay? And as you squat, you wanna make sure that you don't lose contact with any of those points. So here, I lost contact with two points. Here, I lost contact with my middle back. So if you have those three points, you're probably doing pretty well. So that's one way you can do it. Another thing you can do, we'll use the bed <laughs> as the box, uh, a box squat. So now you have a target to get to. And you can combine the box squat with the dowel, because sometimes you'll see this with the box squat. So you can use the dowel to make sure the spine is nice and straight. Okay, we have a nice hip dominant pattern there. Or you have the window pane. So you find a wall. and start a few inches away from the wall with the feet. About your squat stance. Okay, and then you bring your arms up. Squat as low as you can without letting your knees and face touch. And back up. If I fail, I'm leaning too far forward or I'm gonna fall backwards. So those are the three most remedial cues to help help with good squat form. Cool, I liked it. Let's move on to a little bit of Q and A. Um, there were a couple of questions. So, Carl, I'm going to let you take the first one. Oh, thank sure. you, by the way, Molly, for telling me there was no sound during that time. <laughs> that was exciting. Um, first one is Judy said she loves our beards, which is amazing. And she asked, what is a Zercher squat? You wanna demonstrate that real quick? What's a Zercher squat? Yeah. So a Zercher squat is, you take, this is your barbell and you just hold it here. So you're holding it in, in your, your elbows and you're squatting. It could be a lunge too. But that Zercher is basically when you're holding it in your, the weight in your elbows. Cool. And while you're still demonstrating, can you also explain how the soleus is a knee extensor? Sure. So the soleus here goes, goes across your ankle joint in the back, right? So it's one of your calf muscles. Okay. So if I'm down here, so it attaches to my shin bone in the back. If I'm down here, right, here's my knee. It's in flexion. So it's bent. This is extension. Okay. So this muscle, because my, my foot is fixed, when this muscle shortens, it's going to pull my shin bone back, which working along with my quads is going to help extend my knees. Does that make sense? Lucia, hi guys. If someone has a good mobility, has good mobility, how can you improve the strength in the bottom position and also improve flexibility? Carl, you want to take that one? I'm going to scan for the other questions. Lou! Lou, what up, Lou? Lou's our friend in Ecuador. Uh, let's see. If someone has good mobility, how can you improve the strength in the bottom position and improve flexibility? If you have good mobility, 
if you probably have good flexibility, so I'm not, I'm not clear on that, um, that, that part of the question, but if, if, if you're having trouble in the bottom and your strength in the bottom position, that's what you kind of want to work on. You, you want to work on holds down in the bottom position, or you can do isometrics. So what, what you have called pin or pin squats or, or rack squats where in, in the squat rack, a lot of times you'll, you'll have those bars that come across that, that are your protection if you fail, right? But what you do here is you get the bar under those pins and you just push maximally in whatever your sticking point is. And you'll, you'll get some good carryover and strength down in that bottom position. There, there's a lot of different tax, tactics you can use there. Tempo squats are great too. Cool. Are there any other questions before we wrap this up? Again, this was just part one. We will be back next week. I promise I won't rush as much, but I will probably speak when there is no audio at some point in time as well. Apparently that's my thing, but <laughs> any final questions before? Cause we really didn't, uh, uh, part two is going to be just as exciting. Judy, final question. What would be the best starting position for the person with serious forward head and lack of thoracic extension. You want to take that, or you want me to? Yeah, can I? Can I at least? Can I tell you where my mind goes right away? Is um, and I'm sure that this is already what's happening, but trying to um, trying to to get the thoracic extension just to be a little bit better, probably with some floor angels with a, the amount of pillow that's necessary to correct for the forward head is probably a good place to squat. Um, then you're going to play the dowel game, but it is challenging because when a person has forward head posture, you want them to get as good as they can, but you don't want to make it impossible. Like for someone who has severe forward head posture, the dowel is their best friend, meaning it's something that they definitely need as a good cue so that they have a nice, tall, long, neutral spine, but they're not going to be able to get it. So you actually need to put something between their head and the dowel to help them hold it. Um, in general, though, if that works, that's a good cue. But if that person has enough forward head posture, you're probably going to start with a really high box squat with them and then maybe incorporate the dowel as well. Um, but it's not a bad idea to to just really slowly work their way in, but hit those T-spine extensors, those scat posterior stabilizers first. Carl, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Like, you know, it depends on how much, much load you can use. Like with, with a, a back squat, that's a, with a lot of people, that's gonna kind of um, accentuate that forward head posture. So using that front load of that goblet squat, it could be really light, but something front loaded will actually kind of like help you get that that extension in the in the the back a little bit and have you a little bit more upright and, and in part two we'll, we'll we'll go into some things like that beautiful well we want to thank you all so much hey the biggest thing you can do for us is just if you think that this was good enough either share the replay or we're going to post it on youtube or just tell people to come next week um We'll do a brief review of what we talked about. So specifically, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us so we can address them in the beginning. And then we just want to do this again and talk about squats. Eventually, we'll talk about deadlifts and stuff like that. Um, thank you all for being a very captive and involved audience. It was a real pleasure. And we will see you next week. Take it easy, y'all. Thanks, guys. Take care. Be safe.